Thank you for joining us today for Transforming Your Classroom with AI. This is our very first AI webinar that we are doing. We're having several more over spring and summer, just so you guys know. Um, this is part of our spring webinar series. And I do have a link for you to the slides, and I will drop that into the chat right now. Just so you know, I have also opened up the chat for you to be able to, to interact if you would like. Otherwise, we do have the Q&A available if you want to ask specific questions, and then we can I can answer those questions at the end or during the session as well. So again, thank you for joining. And just so you know, my name is Leanne Grant, and I'm a PD specialist here at CodeHS. I've been a PD specialist for um, for a year, actually. And before that, I was a computer science teacher in the classroom, teaching anywhere from middle school, very intro um, to APCSA um, Java courses. So I have a lot of experience, wide range of experience. But one of the things that we never used in the classroom was AI when we were there. So, and that is the point of us, of us being here today for this webinar. And so our agenda for today is um, we're going to talk about some lesson planning. We're, um, and when we talk about lesson planning, we provide lesson plans already. So we're going to talk about how to enhance those lesson plans and maybe course mapping for the existing courses that we have. We're also going to talk about how to foster creativity for students and generate activities that resonate with individuals and meet target learnings. Um, did I, I can put the link in the chat again. Let me do that really quick. Oh, okay, got it. Um, then we're also gonna talk about alternative assignments. And when we're talking about alternative assignments, we're gonna focus on differentiated instructions to meet students where they're at, okay? We're also going to talk about rubric comparison. So we're going to create AI rubrics and evaluations of assignments. And we're also going to talk about um, like a code companion, but like my tutor, or we're going to talk about peer projects as well. Okay. And what we're, all of this is made and why we're doing AA, AI, AA, why we're doing AI is to free up some of your time in the classroom as well. So we're going to talk about how to overcome some of those things. So if you don't know, if you've never been in a webinar with us, like I said, we do have the chat and I do have the chat open, but I also have the Q&A. So if you have a specific question, go ahead and either put it in the chat or the Q&A, either one, it does not matter to me. If you are not a member of Code HS right now, since this is a free, um, a free webinar, you can sign up at codehs.com forward slash sign up. And we do um, prefer that you use your um, teacher account um, enable to sign up or when you sign up, enable to get verified as a teacher. Okay. All right. So for those of you who may be new to Code HS, when we're looking at um, at what we are as a company, Code HS is a comprehensive platform. Um, we have computer science in, we have actually K through 12, so it shouldn't just say middle schools and high school here. It's, it's K through 12 curriculum. We have online and offline professional development. We have our free webinars and workshops, and we also have a full software platform with teacher tools and resources. And like I said, um, part of our comprehensive so software platform is instant feedback and submission systems. Um, extensive grading and tracking tools for teachers, and then it's all web-based. It's an all web-based platform, meaning you don't have any additional downloads or plugins needed for most of our courses. So let's talk about AI. That's why we're here. So what I did is I asked Gemini to generate a picture of what is AI. I did it four times, and this is what it came up with. Each image is different, so that tells you something. I asked the exact same question, generate a picture of what is AI four different times and got four different results. And when we think about what our AI platforms can do, and we're mainly gonna be talking about Gemini and ChatGPT, 
is it's evaluating information. So what are some of the familiar things between these pictures? First of all, the light bulb. It's the ideas, okay? It's it's the insight, it's, it's coming up with something. And then it has all these things around it. And to me, when I very first saw these, it looks like a brain. So it looks like a brain wrapped around a light bulb with a question mark inside of it. So it's asking, you're asking the question and it's thinking, or is it? So then I went on from these pictures and asked Gemini, what is AI? And Gemini answered, artificial intelligence or AI is technology that lets computers mimic human intelligence. Instead of following a set of instructions exactly, AI can learn and improve on its own by analyzing data. Think of it as a super powered tool that can help with tasks like grading, suggesting personalized learning activities, and even translating languages. So that's what Gemini brought back to us. When we think of what is AI, we think about how it can support education. And we think about AI as in ChatGPT and Gemini, mostly. So the foundational component for AI is something called an LLM, which is a large language model. They're a type of AI model that is uh, trained on a vast amounts of diverse textual data. So there's just tons and tons and tons of data that is trained and is stored in these. And the term large refers to extensive number of weights or parameters in the model. These weights then allow the model to capture complex patterns and relationships between word snippets called tokens. So when we're entering something in, it's analyzing what we're saying and figuring out a way to answer it. And so in order to understand a token's meaning, an LLM first observes in context using enormous sets of training data. So when I say in context, it's thinking about, um, for example, the word pool. Am I thinking of a swimming pool or am I thinking of the game of pool? Um, when I say season, am I talking about seasoning and cooking or am I talking about a season as in autumn or summer? Um, then there's other ones that are like one versus one, the number one versus I won a game or here and here. OK, or there and there. <laughs> and so it needs to figure out what context you're using the um, the question in or the words or snippets or tokens in and able to answer the question. So the big thing that you that, that is really important is that we don't necessarily need to know how AI chat bots like Gemini or chat GPT were developed in order to use them. What we do need to know is how to effectively use them and what we can use them for. And so um, we should understand their capabilities and it, the strengths and the weaknesses then of AI chatbots. And we have to remember that they're useful tools, but they're not always perfect and they have to be checked. We still are humans and we're still the experts in our field. And so we're using this as a tool, just like you would use any other kind of digital media as a tool. You need to know how to maybe uh, double check certain things, okay? And so in the next part of this webinar here, we're gonna explore ChatGPT's capabilities of enhancing lesson plans. We're going to develop some creative activities, differentiating instruction and becoming a personal tutor or, or working together with somebody else as well. Okay, if you would like to follow along, all I am doing is I have ChatGPT open and we are going, I'm going to be putting some prompts in there. You don't necessarily have to do it as, at the same time, but you can practice at the same time. Maybe you'll get different results. Okay, so let's get into, um, look, see how ChatGPT can help us enhance the lesson plans that we already have here in our system itself. So when prompting an AI chatbot, it's really important to be specific about what you want. You have to keep in mind that the more vague your prompt is, the more vague the output will be and it won't be as good. And so you also have to keep in mind you need to be very iterative in your prompt. So chatbots don't always get it right the first time. 
or the second time. Okay, so that's why we need to, to um, double check. So we're going to start by doing a prompt and we're going to enhance a lesson plan that we already have. Okay, so the prompt that I'm going to enter into ChatGPT is um, you are a high school student, you are, I'm sorry, you are a high school computer science teacher who teaches an introduction to Java course. And you're about to start a unit on classes and objects and teach a lesson on an introduction to classes and objects. So before this course, students had never learned about classes or object-oriented programming. Um, one second, something popped up on my computer and I need to get rid of it. Okay. Um, and then you were also going to ask it to identify a list of five most commonly misunderstood concepts for this lesson. And for each item in the list, provide a way to, um, of how to support students' understanding. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go, whoops, I don't want to go to that yet. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to go to ChatGPT. Okay. So I'm in ChatGPT 3.5. This is a free model of ChatGPT that anybody can use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the bottom and I'm just going to paste that prompt in that I just read to you. So we're a high school computer teacher. I want it to identify a list of five most commonly misunderstood concepts for this lesson. And for each item in the list, provide a way of how to support student understanding. So let's see what it comes up with. And each time we do this, it's going to come up with something different. So the first thing it's going to talk about of being misunderstood are classes versus objects. So the support strategy. Start with real world analogy, like a blueprint is a class versus a building being an object. And explain that a class is like a blueprint that defines the structure and the behavior of the object while the objects are instances of the class that can be created and manipulated in the program. I like that analogy. That's actually a really good analogy. And then the next one, it goes on to attributes or fields and methods. It talks about another misunderstood concept of constructor methods, instances versus class members, and encapsulation versus access modifiers. So if you have never had experience in AI, or in, I'm sorry, yes, in AI, in Java, um, this might be a little bit foreign to you, but these are all things within the classes and objects module that we may come up with. But I wanted to go a little bit further, okay? So it says, using a combination of visual aids, interactive examples, and hands-on coding ex exercises can further reinforce these concepts. But now I want to give up the objectives of the lesson, and then we're going to ask it something else. So I'm going to put in another prompt right after this. And what I'm going to do is it says... Um, these are the, our three objectives. Describe the relationship between classes and objects. Create programs that create or instantiate multiple objects from a given class. And then create programs that call methods on an object and print out the result. I want to identify three ways of how to relate the objects to real world examples that connect well with high school students. So they might really understand that blueprint and building part right? Because they understand a blueprint does a building, but how else can we relate to high school students? So now let's do that. So, oh, social media profile creation. So this is the very first one. This is interesting. So the objective is to describe the relationship between classes and objects. A real world example would be explain that the social media platform like Instagram or TikTok can be represented as a class. Explain that um, or each user's profile is the object, is created based on the class. So your profile is specific to the platform that you're using. Containing attributes like the username, your bio, your followers, and methods like post photo or add friend. The connection is students can relate to creating their own social media profiles where they understand that the profile object is based on the platform's design, which is their class, and can interact with it through various methods. Very, very cool analogy. I love that it actually just came up with that one. You can also um, 
talk about school enrollment systems here, as you can see. And online shopping carts is another thing that students might might definitely relate to. OK. All right, moving on. I'm going to do one. I'm going to do a couple more prompts for the lesson planning. So in my class, I have a lot of kinesthetic learners. OK, so what are three ways to support these students for this lesson? So I'm going to copy that here. So I, I can I get that it's we're relating to the students. We're great, but we have those students that need to be up and moving. Now, what do we do? So we need hands on. Interaction, so the very first one talks about hands on object creation, and this is different than what has come up before. Just so you know, I, I did this in all practicing and it did not come up with these. So um, hands on object creation. Encourage students to physically create objects using props or tangible materials. For example, provide building blocks or labeled cards representing attributes and methods and have students instantiate the objects by arranging these elements according to a given class or structure. You can do interactive coding exercises, so design coding exercises that require students to write and run programs involving class instant, instant, uh, instantiation, method calls, and output printing. Um, if I want to get them away from a computer, that one might not be as as great of an interactive activity for kinesthetic learners so um again this is another example of always to put the exact same prompt in it might give different answers role playing scenarios so um, this is a great one too. create role playing scenarios where students act out the concepts of classes and objects assign roles such as class creator object instance and method caller and have students physically interact to mimic the behavior of these programming elements. That one is really cool because it says to use props and costumes to represent attributes or methods. You could really, really get into this and get very creative and make something that maybe is not as fun to learn, such as objects and classes, very, very fun to learn for students. So um, again, it says by incorporating hands-on activities, incorporating coding exercises and role-playing scenarios, you can provide kinesthetic learners with multiple avenues. That's awesome. So I am expanding and expanding and expanding on my lesson planning right now, but I want to do one more prompt. So I want ChatGPT to now give me five analogies of classes and objects in the real world. So I want it to give me real instances. These are those real world instances that we can we can talk about again, um, just like above, but maybe more examples. So the first one is class is a library, objects are in or, or individual books. So the individual books um, belong in the library. OK, and then you're going to have um, the library class defines the structure and the operations or the methods for checking out books, adding new books, or where they're located, which is great. You have um, classes and objects in a car factory. So you have your car model, and then the actual cars produced of that model. Um, you have that school system again, where it says the students are enrolled in a specific school and the class, um, the class is the student and the students enrolled in the school. That one might be a little bit more difficult for students. And so again, there's an instance that probably we wouldn't necessarily use. But we also have that social media platform again, where we have our user profile and the individual user accounts. And then we have our classes and objects in our restaurant. So you have your item menu, your menu item that you choose, and but the actual dishes served of that menu item are the actual objects that they get delivered. Okay. And it talks about methods for preparing and serving and all this. So by a show of hands or in the chat, any way that you guys would um, can can interact here. How do you feel this the AI or Chat GPT can help in your lesson planning? We get a good sense. Yes, I'd say good. I love the ideas that it came up with to be able to expand to those. High school, you Kim, you do use it for lesson planning already. Do you use it to enhance the lesson plans that we already have or for complete lesson plans? Hmm. 
digging deeper. Great. I love it too. And we're actually going to even go further into, into this next. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is fostering creativity. So we have the lesson plan on how to, how to deliver the information, but now we want them to practice it and we want them to, to be able to show that they have mastery over the, over the classes and objects in this, in this particular sense. So as educators, um, again, we're experts of our practice and, and the content. And we know our students understand how to support, we know our students and we understand how to support them. And with this knowledge and clear prompts in AI, we can ignite ideas and support our students. So now we're going to look at how we can use ChatGPT to brainstorm an end of unit project centered around student choice and creativity. So we're talking about fostering creativity. We're talking about student choice. We're allowing that creativity and then something that has to align with learning targets. So I don't know about you, but I have spent hours and hours and hours and hours creating end of unit um, projects that were maybe not necessarily um, exactly what they had on the platform. I might take the part of this project and part of this project and I would create my own because I did use Code HS in the classroom. But if I wanna create something that's completely out of the box, it took me hours and hours and hours to do. And now we don't necessarily have to do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go back to ChatGPT, okay? And I'm going to give a prompt of all the topics covered in the unit classes and objective oriented programming. That's from that specific module in our Java course. And I took this directly from the syllabus. So you just so you guys know, that's where you can find it. So I'm going to put this pro the prompt with all the topics in it. And then at the very end here, I am asking ChatGPT to develop a project outline for the unit on classes and object oriented programming that allows us for student choice and creativity while aligning with all learning targets, including a rubric for assessing students. Now, what it comes up with for a rubric is going to be interesting because it comes up with different things. So we might actually put this in more than once. So let's see what ChatGPT comes up with. This is just as much as a surprise for you guys than it is as me, because this is live. So I, Okay, so it has a written out rubric this time. Okay, so what this has done here is we have a project title, Object Oriented Programming Showcase. I love it. Project Overview. The students will design and implement an interactive Java, Java application that demonstrates their understanding of object oriented programming concepts. The project will allow students to choose their topic of interest and showcase their creativity in designing classes, implementing inheritance, and utilizing interfaces and polymorphism. Okay, so here's the project steps. And it actually breaks it down into class periods and how long it should take as well. So as you can see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So about two weeks, a little over two weeks of class to do a project. And so the topic selection is um is students choose a topic of interest for their Java application. Are they gonna create a game, a simulation, a utility tool, an educational app? What are they going to be creating? Then they spend two classrooms, two class periods designing classes. So students design the classes needed for their chosen topic, including the class methods, the instance variables, the constructors, the visibility modifiers, and information hiding where ap applicable. So, and then emphasis on using appropriate naming conventions and organizing classes within packages. So about two class periods, okay? Implementing features, then the students implement the core feature of their application, incorporating concepts like the getter and the setter methods, method overloading, and utilizing the Java math class for mathematical operations, okay? Encourage students to use the CodeHS randomizer class to generate random values were relevant in their application. So as you can see, it has 
actually given us a reference to code HS um, because we have referenced it before. And so it's remembering that we're using that. Um, and then we're going to spend two class periods enhancing the functionality where they're going to um, incorporate that inheritance, the abstract classes, and the method overriding, and also implement infer interfaces and modify classes to adhere to interface contra um, contracts showcasing polymorphism in action, okay? They're going to spend two classrooms testing and debugging. They can also do a peer review and feedback session during these time which we're going to talk about here in a little bit, peer stuff. And then one classroom in documentation or class period in documentation and presentation. And so what that would mean is the students create comp uh, comprehensive documentation for their project, including a readme file describing the project, class diagrams, and explanations of the key design decisions. And then they present their projects to the class. And you can do that in a lot of different ways in a showcase demonstrating the functionality, design principles, and object-oriented programming concepts or concepts use, utilized. Then it gives us a rubric, 40 points for design and implementation, and it breaks it down, 20 points for creativity and innovation, 15 for documentation and presentation, 15 for testing and debugging, and then 10 points for code quality and style. Now, I'm going to do one more thing. Um, I'm going to ask it to restructure, maybe if I can, I can type here, restructure the rubric, because I want to see, because I have actually had it come up with where it, it puts it into a table and it's not doing that this time. And so if I was to go back and do this very first prompt again, I told you we might, um, oops, it's right here. We might do the same thing again. I'm going to Oh, here, I'll do it over here. I'm going to put it back in again and see if it what it comes up with this time. This time it's called Object Oriented Program Mastery. And it is has different, some different, this one's a little bit longer. It did break it up a little bit different as well. Talking about the design and design and implementation, testing and debugging, creativity and code. I mean, the rubric still looks the same, but I was really hoping that it would come up with a table and it didn't. And so um, maybe I can make the rubric a table. And I'm wondering if I have to use ChatGPT4 for that. There it is. There's your, your table. So when I said being very, very iterative, you have to be very, very specific in your in your um in your rubric okay or in your prompts themselves so this is an example of how you could break it down and obviously you could um copy and paste this do whatever you needed to do and then into a, a spreadsheet or or however you wanted to do it as well but it did create it how do you guys feel about projects and rubrics we are going to go a little bit deeper into this as well into the rubrics as well um, but i want to make sure that we have enough time to get through everything so we're going to keep going we could spend all of our time playing in chat gpt but we do have to have cover cover a couple other things so um one of the other things that you can use ai for as i mentioned in, at the very beginning is for differentiated instruction or differentiated assessment and so the way that we can do this is we specifically list four different ways. Um, alternate assignments might be one. Um, quizzes and assessments might be another. Supporting examples, like more examples than what maybe we, what we have in the course. And then practice and review. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways that we can do this, but we're really going to focus on this alternate assignments one. I think oftentimes differentiated assignments or differentiation comes in those quizzes, assessments, and assignments more than examples or practice and review. And so um, we're really going to focus on some alternate coding assignments. And 
in the classroom, you run into a lot of different mixed ability levels in um, from from students who are accelerated to students who may need accommodations in a classroom. And then you have those in between students. So you have all this different stuff. But how do we even more accommodate the students than what we include in the lesson plans? We create alternate assignments. So in the past, teachers have often created alternate coding activities. I know I have created alternate coding activities and created alternate coding quizzes and, and everything that I needed to do, but it's was so much time on creating those for a very, very small number of students. And so how can we use AI to help? You, we are gonna use AI because it will quickly generate those alternate exercises similar in difficulty with different functionality. So the new assignments, might be valuable when a teacher wants to provide more practice. It could be a student is returning from an extended absence and you need a similar assignment because the original lessons have been graded or published already. Um, a teacher wants to vary assignments to promote academic integrity, or a teacher wants to, like I said, offer exercises to students with at different mixed abilities. And so let's look at what that would look like. So. Here's an assignment in Java that assesses students on their understanding with writing accessor methods in a class. So students are given a class template and asked to create accessor methods. And we want a similar assignment to test some of the learning objectives. And so I'm gonna actually go to the assignment here and I'm gonna show you what it actually is. If I can get in here, there it is. Okay, so we're going to extend test um, text class from earlier by adding three accessor methods. And so we're going to do this here, get started. Students are going to do this. But what if this has already been published or what if we need something a little bit different? Okay, so we're going to then extend those that or create an alternate assignment. So when I did ask, or when I asked ChatGPT to create an alternate assessment for this, we ask it to create a similar assignment and it provided this. So we don't just write accessor methods, but we're also asked to provide mutator methods too. So this is what it came up with when I asked it to create an alternate assignment. Extend the student class provided below by adding accessor, getter, and mutator setter methods for retrieving and updating student information. The class should include methods to get and set the student's name, ID, and prompt. Um, all I did was put in the um, assignment. The question was, what prompt did you use? I put in the exercise itself and asked it to create a similar assignment, Cr generate a similar assignment to the one of provided above. That's all I put in, okay? Because I didn't have time to do it all here in class. Some of this stuff was done ahead of time. But that's all I did was ask it to create a similar assignment, okay? And so this is what it did. So it, it created both, so both assignments focus on understanding accessor and mutator methods. So it is pretty good. I mean, it, it created something that is very, very similar. It just might have a, just a little bit of a different topic. OK, so let's let's do something. So I'm going to do well, you know what? We could actually do this. Um, what I did is I said, create an alternate Java assignment that is similar in difficulty to the assignment below. So let's just do this. Let's put it in chat GPT so I can show you guys. All right. And ChatGPT does recognize code. So there's what it comes back with. All right, so here's an alternate assignment that builds upon the text message class by adding accessor methods. So here is our information here. And the alternate assignment, it says to extend the text message class further to include additional functionality add the method, all this, that allows the sender to update the message content and then implement a method that prints out detailed information. So example usage 
and they show that here. And at the very end, it says in this extended assignment, students will practice practice extending a class, adding methods for message manipulation, and implementing a method to display de detailed information about the message object. This assignment maintains a similar level of complexity to the original text message class extension, which I think is absolutely amazing. So in a lot of our classes, like the, the AP CSP or the AP CSA, you have alternate assignments. And I didn't know if you guys knew, knew this. Um, it is um, a feature that is, I think, I believe it's a pro feature only, but um, you can assign an alternate assignment that is very similar. But if you are in a course that doesn't have something like that, use the use of this is absolutely amazing to be able to do this. It, you can use this on any assignment that you have. Let's let's make it. Maybe you want to say create a similar assignment, or you want to do a quiz, and you say only give three options instead of four or five options for students. Maybe that you have reduced um, option accommodations for students. You can do that as well. Okay, so that's just a way to to create alternate assignments. The next part is that rubric comparison. So many teachers and organizations like College Board use rubrics to clearly articul to articulate coding project requirements. So this is really particularly true with larger coding projects. So AI can be a great tool to assist teachers and students that are evaluating rubric compliance. This part is very, very cool. So. Often, what is our difficulty is determining if a student has met rubric requirements can be really time consuming and the result is either delayed grading or missed requirements. And so how can AI help with this? We use AI and or student allow students to use AI as a check for rubric compliance. So let's just say you supply a student with the rubric. You can allow the student to use AI by entering their program, then and entering the rubric and asking AI to analyze the program compared to what the rubric requires. And it can either give them a suggested score or it can give them ways to improve it. Okay. So, and then you could do the same thing, but why not let a student do that before they turn it in as well? So we have a lot of different options here. So the first thing I wanna do is I just wanna show you an example. I don't know if you're familiar with APCSP's Create Performance Task Rubric, but I do have it pulled up here. So we're just looking at the written response rubrics. And so for the very first written response, um, you have your, your video here, you have your program requirements, and then you have your written response. And you get zero to one points for each of these lines, three points in total for your first video program requirement and written response. And so it breaks down the reporting criteria, the scoring criteria, and the decision rules. Now, with the new APCSP, um, Create Task, the written response will be during exam day. They don't do it in the classroom, but why not allow the students to put this rubric, input this rubric, copy and paste it into ChatGPT or Gemini if your school allows it, and ask how a program that they created compares to this so they can try to improve it. The whole reason that the written responses got moved to the exam is they don't want students to be able to use AI in order to um, answer the questions for them, but it is you are allowed to use AI to help troubleshoot. And so that is definitely a way that you can do this. But why can't we use this rubric that we created up here? You could do the exact same thing, supply this rubric to the students and allow them, or you can do it to, um, to evaluate it. So let's take a look. Here, so we're gonna fill. Like I said, we looked at our APCSP. So similar to a targeted, oh, well, I didn't really actually put some of this in. It was just kind of an idea, um, because I didn't have anything that was coding compared to the rubric that I was gonna create. So, um, if if I don't have a specific example to show you today, but it is available. Okay, 
I'm going to jump into this very quickly and look at rubric comparison. And so um, this is a course that we are going to be having come out. It is a PD course um, that talks about um, rubric comparisons. So I'm going to go to this one here and show you what a prompt would look like. So consider what grade that you would give the student on a scale of one to five based on the following rubric. OK, so now copy the the copy the below prompt and copy and feed and code and feed it into your favorite AI tool. I'm sorry. So what we're doing is we're copying this code for APCSP. These are the criteria and we're going to see how it comes up. So I'm going to actually copy and paste all of this. I forgot that I put this in here. And I'm going to put this into ChatGPT. Let's see what it comes up with. So let's grade the program. So what it does is it breaks it down by criteria, okay? This program does not involve user input. So it's telling him, nope, it didn't. It tells, it gives direct feedback on each of the criteria. Then it goes and gives a possible score. So they would have a possible five out of six because that first criteria is not met, okay? So there are, it, it's so simple for it to do this. I might come up with a little different of wording, but when you put in a rubric and you're so, so specific about things, it's going to be very specific on what it, what it kicks back to you, okay? The last part I wanna to talk to you about is code and peer review. So this is really similar to a targeted enrichment request where we looked at, um, and so, did you say a project dialogue user? Um, they can, yes, they can actually see the rubric ahead of time. It is part of their handout, I believe, Teresa. Um, and so the students always have access the, the, to the rubric from the very, very beginning. Um, it's part of the, uh, the handouts that you give them at the beginning of the create task. And so they are very much allowed to, to compare their project that they're doing to the rubric that they're, okay. So in code and peer review, um, you we're gonna kind of like look at code review and the, how do we assess here? Yes, they actually, yes, they absolutely can if the school allows it. You're welcome. Okay, so in the code review, so the code runs, but can we do it better? Um, and often working code doesn't, you know, it's not necessarily using the best practices or it's a little incomplete and it might run, but it's not where we want students to be. So we can use AI or allow students to use AI as a code peer review mechanism. So what I mean is instead of another student checking for them, they can use AI to double check for them. So a perfect example is this code here. So the student's written banking application works, but has the student thought of everything before rolling this code into production? So we're gonna ask AI to conduct a code review on this, okay? So what we actually do is I'm gonna go back to this here and we're gonna go to this, this code review prompt. And it says, copy the below prompt and code and feed into your AI tool. How would you improve the following Python banking application? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that prompt and then all of the code, and there's a lot of code, okay? And I'm going to go to ChatGPT, and this is very, very similar to the rubric, but we're just asking it in general, how would you improve it? And so it's saying for error handling, modularization, persistent data storage. It's giving suggestions on how that application can be improved. And so here's an example of how you can start implementing some of these improvements. So it actually gives them in code then how they can improve their coding. And it says this code provides a more structured approach with a class for managing bank accounts, error handling for deposit, and user-friendly in interface with clearer instructions and messages than what the student actually provided to begin with. And so if I go on to this next one here, 
this is, see it coming up with a little bit of different thing, function de decomposition, mine said error handling, modularization, it came up with a little bit, use of functions, error handling was still there, constants, file handling, and then it gave an example of what it could be, and mine might not have been the exact same way. There's not only one way to do things, okay? So um, it's definitely giving examples, and but there, there can be more than one, okay? All right. We are flying through this. We are actually over our time. So <laughs> um, I do want to thank you guys. AI is very, very fun. So we could spend all day on it. Like I said, I want to thank you guys for coming today. Do you have any questions on AI or anything that I covered today that I can answer for you um, before we go? If you do have questions, feel free to hang around. The course that I showed, the PD course, it is not released yet, but it will be released. It is coming out soon. You cannot get early access. I'm sorry. It is not a, a fully complete <laughs> beta testers. I wish we could do beta testing. Um, it's just not a complete, it's not past its final review stage yet. It is coming out very soon. Um, one of the things that you might want to attend here, I'll come back to the workshop survey here in a second, but um, one of the things that you might want to attend to be able to get like a little glimpse is um, our virtual teacher conference. So this weekend on April 13th, oops, go back, go back again. This weekend, we have our virtual teacher conference. Um, you can still register, it is free. Um, you signed up already, perfect. If you do um, attend, you will receive a swag bag, an Amazon gift card. We are giving out Code HS Pro trials through the end of June. So all of this you're you're able to, to get a hold of if you do end up joining and, and actually partaking in the conference but all of the videos will be available. It is a free conference. So all of the available um, videos will be available by the end of next week. We will have them on of our YouTube channel as well. And they will be posted out saying, hey, you know, this stuff is available for you guys. So we are having a glimpse of our AI coming soon during that, um, during the conference. Um, one of the things I said I would go back to here is our workshop survey. If you can, please fill out that workshop survey. Um, I posted in the chat. Um, it just lets us know uh, what we could do to improve our webinars or workshops, anything that you attend. And we do have a couple more coming up and you know how to obviously uh, sign up for them because they are on that free PD um, portal that we have on our website. So I wanna thank you so much for coming today. And if you guys don't, I can hang around for questions. And if you do not have any questions, I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Have a great night.